I'm Bill DeFoy with Studio 500. We're visiting with Stephen. Stephen, it's my understanding that you are a World War II vet and a pilot. Right. I flew with the Third Fleet during World War II in Tinian, Iwo Jima, Okinawa, and we flew cover for the occupation of Japan. The day they signed the surrender on the Missouri, they put every airplane they could get in the air, and we flew one huge circle over Tokyo, Yokohama, and the Missouri. I took off from the carrier that day with 450 gallons of fuel, got back on six hours later with 15. Oh my goodness, so you burned up quite a bit of fuel then. Well, it was a long, you didn't tear, dare take your eyes off of the airplanes around you. Now, what kind of an aircraft did you fly? I flew the Hellcat. The Hellcat. Yeah. Uh, so tell us what... Was squadron VFN-91. So, okay, so can you share with us um, some of your experiences and um, some of the uh, encounters that you had as a pilot? Well, uh, we were the night carrier for the Third Fleet. Most people, when you say Third Fleet, they don't know what you're talking about. American industry did a fantastic job in building the Navy by the time of the Battle of the Philippines. The closer we got to Japan, it was obvious that they need night coverage. So I went through it with my uh, squadron brothers special training to be able to fly off the carriers at night. And our job was to protect the third fleet at night, which consisted of 250 capital ships broken up into five test groups of 50 ships, the complement in each one was the same, uh, four to six carriers, two or three battleships, heavy cruisers, light cruisers, and destroyers, and uh, four American and one British. And our job was to protect that at night and also to do harassing missions. Harassing missions where you had so many targets and you'd either go down and strafe, drop a bomb, which we carried two 500 pound bombs, or fire six five inch missiles, which are equivalent to a five inch shell. And then you had to find the carrier. So, so, so we, uh, at the end of the war, as I said, we flew cover for the surrender of, of, and uh, were kept out at sea for several weeks uh, to fly cover for the occupation and to make sure that the, uh, we could to count the number of airplanes that the Japanese had left. And they were ordered to take off the propellers and line them up on the field so they could be counted. We looked for prisoner of war camps and dropped them medicine and food because a lot of times they were deserted. And after about a month, the ship I was on the carrier, which was a Nessie's class carrier with the Bonhomme Richard CV-31, was ordered to Guam uh, to uh, pick up a thousand Marines and uh, Army, quarter them on the hangar deck and bring them back to the States. And we came into Alameda. How difficult was it to fly on and off of a carrier, let alone at night? Well, you're trained for it. And I, I never minded the landings. The takeoffs were more difficult because you were catapulted and you were heavily loaded. And if anything went wrong, that airplane didn't float very long. And we lost a couple of guys that got what you call cold catapult shots. Now, I did have a number of very close calls. Uh, I was vectored in behind a kamikaze one night, and normally the ship would pick them up, and we had what was called IFF in the airplane so they could distinguish us from the enemy and the vectors in and the airplane was so designed with 
the machine guns and the wings and the, the particular model we flew had four 50 caliber machine guns and two 20 millimeter cannon and they converged at a thousand feet so that in the cockpit we had a radar scope ASP4 and we could pick up that when we were vectored in behind a, a pilot uh, kamikaze we could pick him up as a dot if it, the, the dot was above we were, he was above us if the dot was below we were above him so you centered that dot and when uh, the little dot spread the wings and filled what we call a goal post. You were a thousand feet behind him and at his altitude, and if you fired your guns, you would shoot him down. Now, I had that happen a number of times, and not normally because of Japanese airplanes, the Zeros and the Kates didn't have any armor plate for the pilot, nor self sailing fuel tanks. And every fifth bullet from the machine guns was a tracer so that if you hit the airplane and hit the tank, it caught on fire. And when you usually fall off to the right or left and go down and, and you get captured on your camera gun film. And one night, I, I, I went through all that, fired, hit him, saw the fire, and I got distracted into the cockpit. And for some reason, I don't remember what it was, but when I looked up again, the guy was right above me, upside down. I probably had killed a pilot. And they came down on top of me and his wing went between my wing and my tail and banged in the back of my cockpit. For the matter of a fraction of a second, I wouldn't be sitting here today. I had a lot of trouble though explaining to the maintenance people how I got that banged in cockpit. That is quite an experience. Stephen, thank you so much for visiting with us. And sir, thank you very much for your service. Well, I'll just say one other thing. I'm, sure. I'm 89. And uh, I, I don't consider us heroes. The heroes were the corporals, the privates, and the sergeants with their machine guns and rifles and hand grenades on the ground. They had to take the, the ground. We only helped them. Very good. Sir, thank you again.